Well, the ego will try to hold on to its, its core belief, and the, the core belief of the ego is the belief that you can make yourself any way you want to be. You can invent yourself, you can reinvent yourself, you can keep reinventing yourself, and that's like the core belief of the ego. So the preferences fit into that, because if you have the ability to invent yourself, then you have the ability to invent yourself as you would prefer to be. And the ego can take this thing about no private thoughts, no people pleasing, and and use it almost like taking an adamant stance of saying, I am not going to please anyone in my environment, I'm not going to please anyone in society, I'm not going to please anyone on the planet, except for the person that I believe that I am, I'm going to please them. <laughs> so it becomes, you know, all the ego needs is one image that, you know, you remember that song? It's all right now. Yeah. Learn my lesson well. Can't please everyone, so you got to please yourself. Well, if that self is a smaller self, is a personality self, you the ego will attempt to use the whole no people pleasing thing to I'll do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, however I want to do it. And it's more of just it, it is the sense of defending the egoic preferences and defending the e egoic belief that I can invent myself that's underneath all those preferences. Whereas, when you're truly on the spiritual journey, authentically, and you just want to practice, let all things be exactly as they are. Today, I will ex accept everything exactly as it is. Today I will learn to accept that all things work together for good and that there's no exceptions. Today I will learn to let go and let God. I will cho choose to not judge circumstances, outcomes, appearances. All of that is very, very authentic. And then when you're paying attention to your state of mind and you notice the charge come up, the closed, contracted feeling of, I didn't get my way kind of like that primal, it's not going my way, then instead of the temptation to immediately project with what's wrong with the world, or what's wrong with the people, what's wrong with the planet, what's wrong with the society, or whatever, you just kind of follow that root of that primal feeling down, and you realize that, that you still want to be right about something of the world. And really what that means is you want to be right about the way that the ego set the world up. And then all the specifics follow from that wish. In fact, there's a line in A Course in Miracles where Jesus says, What is temptation but the wish to make illusions real? Let's look at that, the dynamics of that. What is temptation but the wish to make illusions real? People think that they're tempted by by sexuality, by chocolate, you know, by fashion, or material possessions, or the things of the world. But underneath all of those seeming things, if you follow the root down, it still comes down to the wish to invent yourself. It's the still identity wish to invent oneself that's underneath all of those things. I mean, really, what does chocolate mean to, to spirit? What does sex, or lots of possessions, or fine styling, and fashions, and all the things that seem so important to the ego, they mean nothing to the spirit. It's just this wish to have a hierarchy of illusions. This wish to invent oneself that's underneath it. And if you can get to the root of it, then you can transcend temptation altogether. You're not going to try to keep looking for different outcomes, making the world different, looking for a better this or a better that, a better life even. You know, it's fantastic to finally come to a spirituality that says you don't have to try to make a better life in the world. It's very relaxing, actually. That's where you really can land in Hippieville a lot quicker. Uh, if if you start to follow that vibe of, oh, I don't really have to 
make the world a better place. I don't have to, I don't even have to maintain the world. It's fantastic when you start to realize that, that you don't have to maintain it. I mean, you know, I always like the, the Buddhists with their mandalas, you know, they do the fine, fine sand painting and then they get the big rake in there. You know, we could, this is, this campground is like our sandbox, you know, so we put some sticks up and some lights and microphones and sound and we make some geodesic dome and some cabins and campers and tents and so on and so forth, but, you know, we could have a giant rake that would come along and it can't take away your peace of mind, you know, if the sandbox gets a, gets a rake that goes over it, then so be it. But it's, it's only that wish underneath to hold on to, to a, an image as an identity, or to a conceptual identity, just hold on to a concept. I have a friend of mine, Thomas, that I've worked with for years, and he just moved back over here to Park City and got a job at uh, Sundance Film Festival in the help desk, and we talked on the phone about a week and a half ago, and he said, I've been pursuing God for, I don't know, years, decades, and he just said, I think the problem is, is that all along I've had some kind of concept of God that I was pursuing. And I remember he, he used to give me a gift. He gave me this really thick book, maybe about 10, 15 years ago. And it was Evelyn Underwood's book on mysticism. Massive thing. Absolutely massive. You could, you know, use it as a doorstop if you needed to. It's so thick. And it's on mysticism, which for me is, it's got to be the most simple topic on the entire planet. It's the only ism that really has kind of an intuition behind it. Every other ism, socialism, communism, vegetarianism, whatever, it's pretty complicated. I think all, most of the isms, but mysticism, I, I think, you know, you could even chop the ism off of that one and just get mystic, and it sounds a little bit better than mysticism, you know, it's another ism. But he said, I've been pursuing a concept of God all along, and I just am going to drop it now. I don't, I don't really care any more about God, because I've had such a concept of God. And it's easy to make a self-identity around, around God. It's very, very easy to hold on to even these concepts of being a believer. You know, I used to believe there was, there was actually a difference between a being a believer and an unbeliever. But those are still concepts. What does that really mean? You know, it's, there's a psychotherapy pamphlet where Jesus says, belief in God is unnecessary, for God can be but known. It's like, talk about much ado about nothing. It just takes the vast array of what we would call spirituality and just starts to dissolve all of that and say, no, that wasn't it either. You know, we don't really have to even believe in God. Isn't that wonderful? I love that. Every, every time Elisa comes down here, she's always going, I'm an atheist. And I go, hey, I love you. <laughs> because, because really, it's like, isn't it time we just transcended all beliefs? And if, if belief is the domain of the ego, why would we even want to go there? You know, when I see people on, I say, what do you believe in? And they say, I believe in pink pyramids. And it's like, hey, <laughs> good, that's beautiful. <laughs> you know, it's, we don't need to hold on to all these concepts, because they're not bringing us any happiness. I, I find it especially wonderful when I'm traveling around the world, to not hold on to any concepts, any at all. Even though I kind of feel the vibe of forgiveness in my heart, it's not something that, that can be transmitted with words. So when I'm on the train or the plane or walking along, meeting people at restaurants and bookstores and rest areas and all these different things, I'm just kind of in this vibe of feeling the love and joy and connectedness and appreciating it and feeling gratitude for it, but you can't really add anything on to it. 
because it's not it. As soon as you try to put a label on it, or categorize it, or define it even, you can't even define it. And I think that's, that's beautiful, that, that spirit is undefinable. And if we want to truly know the spirit, and live in the spirit, and live as the spirit, then we should quit trying to define ourselves. And, and comparing and contrasting ourselves with, with others, because that kind of comparison and contrasting is not bringing us any peace of mind, any happiness. So it's very much like the Buddhists talk about, empty the mind of everything you think you think, you think you know. That's Lesson 189 to the Simply Do This, Be Still section from the, the workbook. Lay aside all thoughts of what you are, what God is, all things you have learned, before, about everything and everyone. Hold on to nothing. Do not bring with you one thought the past has taught, or one belief that you ever learned before. You know, forget this world, forget this course, and come with holy open arms unto your God. You, you come and you live in emptiness, and the only requirement to live in emptiness is trust. Some of you might have seen, some of you have been to the monastery, you see we have a trust settles every problem now. You know, trust is the only experience, it's the only, you might say, presence that you need to hold on to, to live in emptiness. There's nothing that can take away your trust. Trust is completely invulnerable. We're not talking about trust in the weather, or <laughs> trust in something of form. Trusting in that fabric that's over your heads. Uh, but we're talking about that trust in the Spirit. And to me, that's what my whole life has been, has just been an experiment in diving into that trust. And letting that trust show me of its truth. Show me of its strength. Show me of its reality. It's like you can throw caution to the wind. You can throw everything to the wind if you're in the presence of trust. If this little Hippieville community is, is going to go, and I, I, I like to see the whole world in that way actually already, but, but just in terms of this little microcosm here, it's only going to be trust, divine trust, that will allow it to flourish, that will give you a tangible experience of that happiness and joy. Just bubbling trust. And we have been talking about that. I mean, when Lila and I were talking about it up on the deck right there, it was like, she said, well, I don't want to lead it anymore, and I don't want to oversee it, and I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to really have anything really directly to do with it, kind of informed, but I, I just want to be an inspiration. Just be the inspiration, and that's it. And let it take care of itself. That's trust. You know, we, I was up there with the messengers, and we were writing it out, and I was scribbling, the Spirit was scribbling something, and I had to look down, because the two guidelines that we've lived by was no, no people pleasing and no private thoughts. But I looked down, and I said, what did the Spirit write? And it was, no people thoughts. I was like, oh, that's even better. That's even better. One is better than two. What that means is like, you, some of you have heard of Miguel Ruiz, you know, the Four Agreements, some of you have heard of. One of them was, don't take anything personally. You don't even need four agreements, you just need one. <laughs> that one agreement would settle every problem now. Don't take anything personally, and what that means is no people thoughts. Now that doesn't mean that you should kind of like, have like a, a critic in your mind, like, searching out for any people thoughts, but it's more that, that you start to realize that whenever you're concerned about people, and the well-being of people, and so on and so forth, that, that there is a higher realm above that, which is the spirit, which transcends the personal. It's like even the Bible said, God is no respecter of persons. And so, you know, it's like, Human beings shouldn't try to anthropomorphize God and give God human characteristics. Because in the Bible, in Genesis, it said, 
you know, God created man in his likeness and image, right? That's, that's in Genesis. Well, if God is spirit, then he must have created man, we'll say, the essence of man as spirit. We get apples from apple trees, we get cherries from cherry trees, we get tomatoes from tomato plants. Why would we get flesh and bones out of spirit? Talk about an anomaly. Ooh, that's, that's an anomaly. Flesh and bones from spirit. No, God created man, woman, human, in the likeness of God, which is spirit. Spirit comes from spirit, comes from spirit. If you want to use the Bible word, they've got all those begat words. I mean, when I was a kid in, in Bible class and everything, I, I was always asking, what's, what's with all these begats? Begat, 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 begat. Every page, you know, begat, 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 begat. You know, that's like the linear, that's the linear illusion of the begats. You know, Cain and Abel and, you know, all the stories and this and this is begat, 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 begat. And what this is really about is more be, 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 be. <laughs> Just be as you are, be as a spirit, and loosen and empty your mind from everything in the end that seems to be the linear construct. I just had a, a talk with Lisa. She's she's coming actually. She's going to start doing the MCing tonight. But um, she called me and I talked to her and she said, "It's glorious, David. It's so glorious. I'm seeing the whole universe as my mind. When I'm happy, the whole universe is happy. It's, there's nothing out there that needs to be fixed or changed. It's so glorious. Me being in my joy. Me being in my sense of wonder." my sense of glory is, is what the whole universe is, because there's no world apart from my mind. And so she had left the festival at the first, right before the first day, and just went in, inward, inward, inward into this glorious experience of the allness and completeness of everything. And then she said, she, I feel like I'm going to burst. I got to come back to the festival, <laughs> because I got to let it out. I got to I got to express it, I got to shine it, I got to let it pour out. And that's the feeling that we're opening up to. This, like you have an explosion of love, an explosion of joy inside of you, and you have no control over it. You know, it's just going to keep exploding and exploding and exploding. You know, like a, almost like a nuclear reaction, except without the radioactivity. <laughs> Just a love reaction that just kind of extends and extends and extends. So, ultimately, that's when you get more and more into the joy, then you start to realize that, that you're not trying to please any people, including the person that you have believed that you were. Because that's just the same as the rest. Even if you could snip society, out of the picture. Even if you could snip his family out of the picture and you were the individual, it, you know, you still would get into the same traps just with the little individual construct as you would with the society construct. It's been a big something in, throughout the years in philosophy, the individual versus society. This idea of individual freedom is a hoax. There is no such thing as individual freedom. In A Course in Miracles, we were told, what do you want? Freedom of the body or freedom of the mind, for both you cannot have. Don't you love it when truth speaks to you that directly? And how many of us have searched for freedom in relation to the body? And yet, the, we have hints with Man Mandala, with Mandala, with uh, with Gandhi, you know, they, they were very, very content, even though their bodies seemed to be imprisoned for most of their lives. Their, their minds were not imprisoned. They kept shining the light of truth, shining the light of freedom, even though the bodies seemed to be in a jail cell. They weren't trapped at all. They, they told us, I am not trapped. I am, I am here and I am free by choice, and I am not trapped. And so those are like the way showers to this way where we can actually 
experience a true freedom that is not limited to our constructs and concepts about the body.